started. Welcome everybody. It's great to see some familiar faces again and some new people. Um, it's also, I also would like to welcome those watching from home. So thank you for being here. And don't worry, Felicia will be back um, next month. She didn't leave us. Um, uh, but you get me tonight because she had a prior engagement. Uh, my name is Erin Quinn Valcho, and I am the museum curator for the Lacey Museum. And our speaker tonight is Tim Ransom, who will be sharing the story of Friedrich Richter, who for a time owned property on the east bank of the Nisqually Delta, land that would one day become part of the Braggett family farm. And before we dive into that, I would like to begin with a land acknowledgement and a little bit of museum news. Maybe. Forward. <laughs> Which button did he tell you to use? The middle one. Huh. Zia, would you press the space bar, please? Not working? There you go. Thank you. All right. So the Lacey Museum um, is on the traditional territories of the Coast Salish people, specifically Southern Lachute Seed speakers, Nisqually and Squaxin Island. We acknowledge and remember not to forget those tribal people that are named, but not recognized today and have been absorbed into other tribes for survival or were relocated. We recognize the ancestors and their relations that are still here. Lacey and the South Puget Sound region are encompassed by the Treaty of Medicine Creek, signed under duress in 1854. We respect and affirm tribal sovereignty, and as a part of the city of Lacey, we work with the Nisqually and Squaxin Island tribes in government-to-government -government partnership. All right, next slide, Z. All right, on to some museum updates. We'd love to see you at the museum. We're open Thursdays and Fridays, 11 to 3, and Saturdays, 10 to 4. The Smithsonian poster exhibit called Journey Stories is finally up. And this exhibit explores how movement has shaped our nation with a look at American expansion and migration from the earliest settlers and Native American displacement to the effects of transportation on modern mobility. Our tours do include local stories and Felicia has been working really hard on them so I know she'd love to give you a tour and I definitely encourage you to come by and check it out. After the presentation tonight, Tim will be selling his books over there, and in the back, I will have Thurston County Historical Journals for sale. Um, so if you're interested, please um, come see us, and we'll be glad to exchange money for the product. All right, next slide. Coming up next month, we hope you'll join us for our April History Talk with David Nicandri. Using a series of rarely seen historic maps drawn from the collection of the Washington State Library and the Washington State Historical Society, David Nicandri will discuss the evolution of the Northwest Passage as a cartographic concept. I think it's going to be really interesting. I don't know about you, but I love maps. All right, now for tonight's presentation. As usual, we will hold our Q&A section at the end, and we'll do our best to get questions from our in-person and online attendees. My delightful assistant, my daughter Zia, will be handing around the microphone for any of our in-person folks who've got a question, and I'll be handling the online questions. So for those of you at home, um, feel free to submit those questions to the Q&A button that's probably at the bottom of your screen. That's where it usually is. And um, now I would like to introduce Tim to you all. Um, Tim is a historian and author. He attended Williams College and the University of California at Berkeley, receiving undergraduate and graduate degrees in psychology. His career has spanned photographing primates and other wildlife in East Africa for National Geographic magazine, studying and phot photographing otters, bald eagles, and orca whales in the San Juan Islands, working as the curator of collections at the Whale Museum in Friday Harbor, and a 15-year stint as a scientist and educator for the Puget Sound Action Team. He has been an active historian for almost 50 years with a special interest in oral and local history. He has written two books, including his most recent one, For the Good of the Order, The Braggett Farm, and Land Use in the Nisqually Valley. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. Good evening. 
Nice to see some familiar faces. <laughs> we'll hope we get all of the tech working. I'm not even sure that mine's going to. But there it is, all right. I had the honor of recounting the history of the Braggett family and their 100-year ownership of, the, uh, of a dairy farm and for the good of the order, the, the uh, Braggett farm and land use in the Nisqually Valley, and that's the book that's over there. The book focuses on the issues of land stewardship and the relationship of private ownership to the public trust through the lens of the trials and travails of the Braggetts as their, their farm was the target of many proposals to develop or manage the Nisqually Delta. The efforts to redefine the highest and best use of the farm, which Ole Braggett acquired in 1896, really began when Pierce County considered condemning it by eminent domain in 1917 for inclusion in the huge acreage the county wanted to sell or give, excuse me, to the US Army for the location of Camp Lewis. About the same time, the Point Defiance Railroad line was put in, running from Tenino through Nisqually, then called Sherlock, along the coast to Tacoma and carving a chunk out of the farm along the way. Well, I'll orient you here a little bit. Um, Whoops, I don't want to do that. That's what I want to do. That's uh, what became I-5 back then in the 50s. It was uh, old 99. And the Braggett Farm is largely, at, the, at that time, was inclu includes some of the highlands there, but mostly was um, this area to the east of the river um, that uh, was had been initially tidal flats, estuary flats which they, had, they were in the process since about the turn of the century in, uh, in diking up to turn into more pasturage and for, for uh, running for dairy cows and for also for hay. So, uh, oh, I keep doing that. Uh, this is the Nisqually River, and over here is what would become the, the wildlife refuge uh, that we know and love today. Um, oh, and, and the last, uh, yes, the, the railroad line actually was put, the, the Point Defiance line was put right along here, running up towards Tacoma. So in fact, you're sort of looking east, uh, even though you think I-5 and so on is north-south, but it's east-west at that, at that point in time. Proposals to site a military ammunition dump and major manufacturing plants in or near the Nisqually Delta were put forth during and after World War II followed by the Babari brothers' scheme to locate a garbage dump on the tide flats in the 1960s. That was also the de decade when the southbound lanes of I-5 were put in, taking part of the Braggett farm with them. Okay, now let's see, there we go, good. Both the federal and state governments began assessing the Delta for various public use, uses mid-century, and in the 1970s, the ports of Olympia and Tacoma schemed to expand their footprints into the Delta. The Port of Tacoma was the bigger thinker and spent years trying to establish a facility there that could handle the new super tankers being manufactured by the Japanese. And so it went. As soon as the federal government established the wildlife refuge, partly in response to the, the port's plans, uh, it, 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 wanted, it wanted to turn the entire delta into a protected area by acquiring the Braggett Farm as well, which by then consisted of 410 acres of diked tide flats and uplands, as, as I said. And then there, there were the designs of the environmentalists and the conservationists to protect the delta and or make it available for public use. The seemingly unremitting pressure of, of these attempts to wrest the land away from them had a severe impact on the family which spent their later years almost entirely focused on doing what they felt was necessary to protect their farm and their legacy. Finally, orphaned, elderly, and childless, the sole survivor, Kenny Braggett, shown here, hit upon a strategy to ensure that his family's land and legacy would be honored. He sold it to the Nisqually tribe, even though he knew that the tribe's immediate goal was to break out the dikes, which his family had begun building over 100 years before, uh, in order to restore estuarine habitat for the salmon runs.
But the tribe would honor the land like his family had, and that was, that was what was important to him. I put over 20 years into the Brag Braggart project, doing extensive oral histories of Kenny, his family, friends and enemies, and their neighbors. I conducted first-hand research following the family in locations ranging from western Minnesota to Tacoma and Lakewood, and then to Nisqually. I spent countless hours on the internet and in libraries reading the accounts of those that had been associated with the lands uh, uh, for over 150 years. It was a lot of fun, I must say. I can only hope that my attempt to memorialize the Braggart family, as Kenny liked to put it, often comes, comes close to what he had in mind and that the book will ensure that the family story will be known in those days ahead when so many others are forgotten. But this evening's talk <coughs> is not about the book. Tonight I want to share with you a little of what I discovered about some of those who had been involved with the land before Ole Braggart ended his immigration from Norway there in 1896. My voyage of discovery itself combined significant uh, guesswork, great good fortune, and a lot of hard work. It ended up establishing some fascinating links between 19th century Nisqually and the greater world outside, including a direct one to the President, President of the United States, Ulysses S. Grant himself. It all began, really, when Fred Richter fell off the scow that he was pulling back across the Nisqually River towards his cabin there on the far right <coughs> on the east bank of the river in May 1880. He probably drowned immediately, though his body was not recovered from the swift-moving river by his neighbors until July. Who was Friedrich Theodore Richter, as he was known to his parents, friends, Fred to his neighbors, and what brought him to Nisqually? For me, that mystery and my efforts to solve it began one day when a descendant of Daniel Mounts, a neighbor of Richter's, presented me with a cache of Richter's effects. Most, mostly letters written to, in a spidery, to me, illegible German, but also a few old photographs. And among them was a portrait of a young man dressed in a very in interesting uniform. Parts of the, of the uniform were vaguely familiar. The hat, the hat was perhaps Civil War uh, vintage, as were the boots, I thought. What about the, the shiny cape? And was that a white apron and a bugle? <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> well, sometime later, well, actually more than a year later, I had the beginning of an answer, thanks in large part to the documents that accompanied this photograph of Richter, for in fact, it was him. Those papers, a passport, membership cards, invitations to parades and other events, and letters from family members, told a story of teenager Friedrich's immigration from Prussia on June 3, 1867, to Chicago. Richter was not alone. Three quarters of a million Germans immigrated to America in the 1860s, a million in the 1850s. German immigrants accounted for 35% of all immigrants to the United States from 1850 to 1869. <clears throat> Five million altogether in the second half of the 19th century. And a surprising number of them were from what became northern Germany, like Richter. You'll, you'll remember, I hope, uh, that at this time, uh, the, the world of uh, the German world, so to speak, was in great flux politically in, in terms of who controlled what. But why then, and why so many people? The reasons? They left home for many, crop failures, restrictive inheritance laws, high rents and prices, the chaotic effects of the Industrial Revolution and state building and war, as well as religious, religious intolerance at home. They came to the US for the American dream, well advertised by relatives who had gone before, and flights of rhapsodic, rhapsodic journalism in travel brochures and advertisements. Perhaps they read something like this description of the Puget Sound region that appeared in the Puget Sound Journal, and I quote, the resources of the country are yet undeveloped. 
Commerce, with the exception of the lumber and coal trade, is dormant, and manufactories are comparatively unknown, despite the magnificent power at command and the large market for the sale of manufactured goods. The territory does the largest lumber trade in the world, and a fleet of white-winged ships, I love that, white-winged ships laden with spars, masts, and lumber can, can be seen daily treading their way through the waters of the Sound. The minerals of the territory, which are rich and varied with the exception of coal, have not been developed at all. Hence, capitalists have now an opportunity of monopolizing the copper and, and, or, or iron mines so, nu so numerous throughout the country and by working them furnish employment to many persons. The laboring man can earn a livelihood with more facility and live cheaper than in other portions of the country." End quote. And there are a few more quotes from other parts of the, of the journal. Now to be clear, I'm not speaking of the Volga, Ger Volga Germans, those unfortunate souls who were rec recruited by Catherine the Great to immigrate to Russia and farm lands along the Volga River in, in the 18th century. Initially allowed to maintain their customs and religious practices, by late in the 19th century, the so-called Volga Germans came under extreme pressure from the Russian government to culturally assimilate, including submitting to conscription in the Russian army. This they, this they, many of them pacifist Mennonites, chose not to do, but instead immigrated, emigrated to the Americas, Canada, United States, and South America. In the US, the Volga Germans, mostly families, settled primarily in the Dakotas, Kansas, and Nebraska. But some came to many central and western states as well. In Washington, small groups settled in the Palouse country around Endicott and Ritzville in the early 1880s. A few ended up in Bellingham, Tacoma, Walla Walla, Walla Yakima, and Vancouver. Richter, on the other hand, represented a large demographic of mostly young single men, many of them educated and trained in some profession. He was born in Saxony in 1850, and to judge from the few photographs he left behind and by his literacy, his upbringing was middle, middle class, though rural. He may have apprenticed in a trade in his teenage years, for later German, -like, German language documents refer to him as a mechaniker, a generic term for skilled laborer. Friedrich was only 17 when he left home and his parents for the New World one of the four out of their six children that would emigrate. Upon arrival in the country, young immigrants like Richter were drawn to existing German enclaves, especially Chicago. In the 1860s, German immigrants made up over half of the city's population of 300,000. Early on, Richter lived with fellow immigrants from Saxony at a succession of addresses on South Wells Street, including one above a meat market there. Nicknamed the Cabbage Patch after being populated and heavily farmed by Germans in the 1850s, the Well Street area along the east bank of the Chicago River is the center of what's called Old Town Chicago today. So it was a good time to be in Chicago if you were a young immigrant trying to understand and adapt to a new home. It was all an, also an interesting and exciting time for in 1867, the year that Richter arrived, Ulysses S. Grant was running for president of the United States, and he had made Chicago his, polit his political base. And it was there that Richter encountered another German, Edward Solomon. Edward Selig Solomon was born on Christmas Day, 1836, into the Jewish aristocracy of the Duchy of Schleswig, actually then part of Dem Denmark. It became part of Germany uh, as part of the machinations later. He attended university in the town of Schleswig before immigrating to America, also as a 17-year-old in 1853, where he quickly made his way to Chicago. Solomon eventually took up the study of law, was admitted to the bar in 1859, and at age 24 was elected to the Chicago City Council as alderman to the Sixth Ward only a year later. <clears throat> the outbreak of the Civil War in 1861 interrupted Solomon's promising political career, 
<coughs> excuse me, but at the same time, it brought him notoriety for bravery, skill in battle, and strategic expertise that was to stand him in good stead in the post-war years. Edward enlisted on May 6, 1861, joining Company H, 24th Illinois Infantry, under a Colonel Friedrich Hector, Hecker, another German lawyer whose radical championship of popular rights and participate, participation in the failed revolution in Germany of, of 1848 had driven him from his home in Baden. Solomon quickly rose to the rank of captain in the 24th, but when Hecker resigned his commission following a disagreement with his officers, Edward followed him and helped him form a new regiment, the 82nd Illinois, which came to be composed mainly of German, Jewish, Swedish, and other European volunteers. Company C the 80, of the 82nd consisted entirely of Jews who had been equipped and armed by the Chicago community. Now a lieutenant colonel, Edward became the quintessential Civil War hero and was reported to have had two horses shot out from him just at Gettysburg. Shot out from under him, if I didn't say that right. Solomon and the 82nd exemplified the backbone of the Union Army, serving at most of the major map battles from 1863 to 1865, including Chancellorville, Gettysburg, Missionary Ridge, Risaka, New Hope Church, Peachtree Creek, the siege and occupation of Atlanta, and Sherman's march to the sea. Solomon concluded the war as a brigadier general with commendations for bravery and excellence as an officer all by the age of 29. Back in Chicago, Edward received a hero's welcome, especially from the radical Republicans. <coughs> the politics of the time were complex and often confusing, but then when, when are they not? During and after the Civil War, the Republican Party underwent several upheavals, one of the most intense when pro-Lincoln members decamped in 1864 to create the National Union Party. Those left behind, the so-called rep radical Repu Republicans, were fiercely abolitionist and anti-slavery, as were most German immigrants, by the way. They felt that the southern states should be dealt with severely, both during and after the war, opposed Lincoln's leniency in that regard towards the South, and war hero Grant was their man. At that time, the Democrats were largely pro-antebellum South, white-centric, and severely racist. Complicating matters was the founding of the GAR, the Grand Army of the Republic, in 1866, just two years before. <coughs> the GAR became one of the most influential of the many groups created by and for Union, union veterans, first for camaraderie and social connections, later for, for political purposes. To quote Wikipedia, the GAR initially grew and prospered as a de facto political arm of the Republican Party during the heated political context tests of the Re Reconstruction era. The commemoration of Union Army and Navy veterans, white and black, immediately became entwined with partisan politics. The GAR promoted voting rights for Negro veterans, as many white veterans recognized their demonstrated patriotism and sacrifices, providing one of the first racially integrated social fraternal organizations in America. And I just want to, to, to say that some of the quotes that I, I will be delivering tonight used older terminology for, for African Americans, for black folks, and I'm going to honor their, their existence and continue to use them but uh, only in quotations. So in early 1868, Salomon, now the Cook County clerk, got together with several colleagues, including the editor of the Chicago Times, members of the GAR, GAR all, to come up with that marketing gimmick that, gimmick that would help Grant and his running mate, Schuyler Colfax, defeat their opponents, Horatio Seymour and Francis Preston, Preston Blair, Jr of the Democratic Party later that year. And they came up with a doozy, I think, taking as their models both the GAR, which is an outgrowth of the war was organized on military lines, and the history of an organization called the Wide Awakes. 
Organized by the Republicans more than 30 years before, the Wide Awakes were a youth group that had paraded, carrying torches and banners in support of Lincoln's campaign in 1860. And as a photographer that, uh, or a graphics person, I guess, this fascinates me because this was one of the, the things they carried and inside it was a flame. And so it was essentially, they, they called them transparencies. They were, they were slides on the ends of sticks <laughs> uh, leading, leading the beginning of, of the development of that kind of stuff. Recognizing that, that, that they had hundreds, even thousands of young men who after the end of the war were, mili were, were military veterans looking for something to do, some purpose, Salomon and his cronies proposed to create a similar organization in support of Grant, one which came to be called the Tanners. Playing on Grant's man of the people nickname, the Galena Tanner, which reflected first his, his birth origins in Galena, Illinois, but also his and his father's participation in the business of tanning hides. Organized along military lines like the White Awakes and the GAR, Tanner's groups were the first to systematically use long and exciting torchlights parades as a political technique blending it in the evening's entertainment with a chance for voters to meet and greet the candidates. Now, I don't know if you can see that well enough, but read that for us? yeah, that's what I was going to do. Yes, um, the, the gentleman in the, in the middle of the course is Grant in, with, his, uh, with his apron. To his, to his right, the left side of the picture, is uh, Mr. Tammany of, of Tammany Hall fame backing the, uh, the uh, Grant's opponents. Uh, Seymour ne nearest him. Well, I can do I can do this. That, Seymour and Blair, to the to the uh, Grant's left, our right, are uh, uh, Confederate leaders of the Civil War, uh, starting with Lee and and a couple of others. And uh, so, uh, Grant. Uh, uh, see, uh, Tammany is saying, here, General, is a couple more hides to be tanned. When will they be done? <laughs> Grant, who was smoke, smoking a, a cigarillo, looks like, says, well, I'll finish them all off early in November. And then Lee and, and the others are saying, this is to certify, oh, I got the wrong glasses on, <laughs> that we have, we have had our hides tanned by U.S. Grant and the, and the work was, was by him thoroughly done. Signed R. E. Lee, S. P. Buckner, and uh, oh, uh, Pemberton. Uh, yeah, Pemberton. Okay. So th this and uh, th this is a, a, a Courier and Ives print. I, you know, this, it's wonderful to be able to find things like this these days. Meanwhile, the Democrats. <coughs> who were still hoping to reverse the outcome of the Civil War, created their own groups called the White Boys in Blue, made up of Union soldiers like the Tanners. But the White Boys shared the strong and often bitter opposition of their party to voting by African Americans, to the Freedmen's Bureau, which had been organized, organizing black schools in the South, and to Republican Reconstruction policies in general. Both the Tanners and the White Boys in Blue sought to increase voter turnout in national elections <clears throat> by throwing wildly enthusiastic and fantastic torch-like parades while dressed in uniforms reminiscent of the Union Army. In every city, torch-bearing soldiers marched to the local railroad station as an escort to a group of the most prestigious local dignitaries intent upon meeting arriving political celebrities and accompanying them to their hotel or the site of a well-advertised event. One Chicago historian wrote, and I quote, military bands, fireworks, bonfires, and booming cannon added heightened excitement to the occasion. Once arrived at the county courthouse or meeting hall where the speakers were to give their orations, the appearance of the torchlight soldiers in their colorful uniforms, their cheering, their singing, and their patriotically impressive presence added to the political excitement of the evening. And if the Tanners and the white boys met of an evening, blows and even shots were exchanged. Like the white awakes had, the Tanners wore distinctive oilcloth capes and caps 
which I think sounds familiar, largely to protect their clothing from rain and, and, and kerosene drippings from their torches, as well as leather aprons that indicated their tanner affiliation. Every conceivable organization had its own tanners club, from municipalities to labor groups like carpenters, immigrant groups, and other interest groups, often all combined at once. African-American tanner companies sprang up in towns large and small and held special events with particular relevance to their apparent change in status due to the outcome of the war. In a special dispatch to the Chicago Tribune on September 21st, 1868, it was announced that, quote, the colored people of Springfield will celebrate the anniversary of the issuance of the Preliminary Emancipation Proclamation tomorrow. A company of colored tanners will be in attendance from Jacksonville. The Honorable S.M. Cullum, General John M. Palmer, Friedrich Douglass, I think it's actually Frederick Douglass, <laughs> uh, General McClelland, and, and the Honorable B.T. Edwards and others have received invitations to be present and address them. Frederick Douglass has already arrived and will positively deliver an address upon this occasion. Sounds like they didn't have a lot of faith that the others were going to show up, but that's fine. Oh, no, this is not working. What'd you do to me? Oops, oops. Okay. Uh, here we go. Yeah. What does all this have to do with Richter? Well, from the picture and his mail, we can conclude that he was definitely a tanner and was fully involved in the festivities designed to get Grant elected. On August 29th, 1868, he was scheduled to drill with Company B of the Tanners, and on October 28th, he was invited to join the company for, quote, a last grand parade, but, end quote, before Election Day on November 5th. Due to inclement weather, the parade actually took place the day after Grant's victory at the polls. 20,000 tanners marched before over 200,000 revelers in, quote, the greatest demonstration ever witnessed in the West, according to the Chicago Tribune. Well, life must have been pretty anticlimactic for Friedrich for a while after that. He left Chicago and briefly and unsuccessfully speculated in real estate. The value of a lot he bought in Blair City, Iowa, tanked when Mr. Blair, president of the Dubuque and Sioux City Railroad, decided to put a line through Blair, a town he founded for the purpose instead. So Richter returned to Chicago, his future undetermined. Meanwhile, Grant and in turn Salomon had been busy. Rewarding Salomon for his success, both in the Civil War and in the Tanner Campaign, Grant appointed him to be the ninth governor of Washington Territory in 1870. Remember, Washington wouldn't get statehood until 1889. Almost immediately, Salomon recruited an acquaintance, one John Henry William Sternberg, a, a German from the northern city of Hanover. Sternberg was a furrier and Salomon asked him to follow on to Washington territory to pursue the fur trading business there. This Sternberg did, accounting for the appearance of his name on the ledger of George Farmer's boarding house in Olympia in, the mid, in mid 1870. Now this is where it starts to get a little more complicated again. Also living in the boarding house were two other North Germans, August Charles Wolfe and Adam Yost. Like Richter, Wolfe appeared to be speculating in land. He owned about 100 acres in the Nisqually Valley on the east side of the Delta, which in three years he would sell, sell to, wait for it, Friedrich Richter. <laughs> Circle fill. But we are getting ahead of ourselves a little bit. There was one more step, one more impact, important act by Sternberg that needed to take place. Now firmly ensconced in Olympia and perhaps missing his wife, who with Sternberg's had stayed behind in Chicago, Governor Salomon convinced Sternberg to return to Chicago to gather up a, a quote, colony of immigrants and their wives. This he did and soon a party of 40 some families, including the, the Mrs. Salomon and Sternberg, were traveling by rail to Oakland, California. There they embarked on the steamer Idaho for Steelacum where, with financial and other support from the governor, they would take up the lives of farmers in the South Sound. Among them was Richter and his future partner in land, Joseph Klee. 
Back to August Wolf. I, I haven't been able to find out much about him other than that he was about Richter's age and was from Mecklenburg, also in northern Germany. Possibly he too came to the area with Solomon's army. In any case, the 1870 census lists his profession as upholsterer, and three years later he was employed, probably in that capacity, in J.C. Hoare's establishment in Olympia, quote, manufacturer, importer, wholesale and retail dealer in furniture, bedding, carpets, picture frames, brackets, toilet seats, vases, and all furnishing goods, end quote, according to his letterhead. After his stint in Olympia and Nisqually, Wolf went on to careers as a soda maker, bottler, and finally a candy maker with the Pacific Coast Business, Business Company in Seattle. He died at age 61 in 1909. Wolf bought the 100-acre Nat Nisqually parcel from the Goves, Warren and Hepzibah. They had been living in the Nisqually Valley since 1863, and it looked like they were intending to stay, and they were not of German background. They were dyed and true multi-generational Main, Mainites from the East Coast. Warren had established a ferry and later a bridge across the river, and they had housed the post office and a school marm in their home while raising several children. But the great flood of 1868 swiftly changed their minds. Houses built close to the, uh, to the river, like those of the Gove and Mount's families, were inundated. It took three nights for the water to recede, during which they all slept on the floor of their neighbor, Philander Washburn. The flood left their farms covered in Murray's mud slurry and a forest of trees, stumps, and, and all that had been dislodged by the waters. Characteristically, Daniel Mounts resolved to stay and to build a new house out of the floodplain, which he did within a year. The Goves had had enough and returned to Stilicum, where they, where, they, where they had lived previously, and sold the land to Wolf in 1871. Wolf wasn't a farmer. He paid others to harvest the major assets of his property, the marsh grass that the Puget Sound Agricultural Company, a venture of the Hudson's Bay Company, used as a poor quality hay for its livestock. Perhaps he shared the hope of many that the sighting of the western terminus of the Northern Pacific Railroad would be awarded to Olympia, and that a line from there to Tacoma would come right through his property. But when the terminus was awarded to Tacoma and Olympia was left high and dry, Wolf was ready to sell to Richter and Klee and move on. Now that's the second time I've mentioned Klee, so I'd better introduce him to you. Joseph Klee's story is less dramatic than Richter's. He didn't get to Chicago until after the dust had settled on the Tanners and Grant's election. As far as we know, he didn't dabble in real estate before coming to Nisqually, and he lived to the ripe old age of 82. Nonetheless, his story is of interest, not the least for his role in helping develop the wholesale furniture business in Tacoma, world class for its time in, in southern Tacoma years later. For our purposes, though, you should know that Joseph was born in 1845, making him uh, at least five years older than, than Richter, again in northern Germany, in Prussia, just like Richter. He made it to Chicago in 1870, just in time to join Richter and over 100, 100 others for the week-long trip by rail from Chicago to California and thence, then by, and thence by another week's voyage on the steamer Idaho to Steelaco. I have no idea what the nature of the relationship was between Richter and Klee, whether they were friends even. But, but three years later, after job searches that took him to Puyallup, Kalama, and Portland, Klee returned to the South Puget Sound area to join, to join Richter in buying Wolf's 100 acres of marshland. The two young men kept their holdings and, in fact, enlarged them by the purchase of a couple of adjacent upland parcels for about five years before Klee sold out and headed for Tacoma, where he had been working at least part-time for a while. He would return to the Nisqually Delta at least once more on the occasion of the sale of Richter's effects after his death the summer of 1880. That event and the preparations leading it up, up to it are a tale worth telling all on their own, and I refer you to my blog, www.ransom-notes.com, where I have done just that. 
Suffice it to say that the participants represented a cross-section of the men on hand in the country at the time. In addition to Klee, at least seven were recent German immigrants. Six were first or second generation English or Scottish. One was Canadian by birth, one was French, and two were full or part Indian. Some had moved west from Illinois, Ohio, Virginia, Maryland, and New York. The group in range, ranged in age from 12 to 75, and in employment from grave digger to farmer, scribe, lawyer, and judge. Many of those who attended the sale of Richter's effects, largely clothing, livestock, and, and farm tools, were well-known na names in the region at the time. Daniel Mounts, a major landowner in the valley and administrator of Richter's estate. George McAllister, a relative of James of the same name, who was the first casualty uh, of the so-called Puget Sound Indian War. Nathaniel Orr, first citizen of Steelacum, and his younger brother James. Edward Huggins, the last man standing at Fort Nisqually before the Hudson Bay Company left the territory altogether. Henry Walker, who in four years would marry a Nisqually woman named Kitty, whose first husband had been August Valentin Kautz, yet another German, until he left her and their two boys behind to resume his role, including more marriages in East Coast white society. John Adams O'Neill, a pioneer Puget Sound steamboat engineer. John Northover, William Young, and Daniel Rhodes, who, along with Daniel Mounts and George McAllister, represented the joining of white and native families that was a common feature of life at the time. And Omar White, a stalwart of Steelacum, who helped build the first Protestant church and the first community library. Just I want to just take a moment to introduce you to some of the folks that we're talking about. At least uh, a few years later, this is this is a, a gathering uh, to celebrate Frank Mounts. Whoops, that's Frank uh, uh, birthday. Um, uh, but um, this is Daniel Mounts and his wife Catherine, who was um, half Indian. She was the daughter of. John McLeod and, and, an, and, an, and a Nisqually woman. And uh, many of these are their children. They had 12. But also in here are, are um, uh, well, let's see. Yes, that's uh, McAllister. There's Northovers in here um, and, and others. And it's quite, a, quite an important group of people. And it's fantastic to have that picture survive. Oh, John and, and John, John Mounts is in there as well, of course. The sale of Richter's effects, his clothing, animals, tools, and bugle, and a Meerschaum pipe, took place at the Mounts home and netted altogether $130.87. Perhaps indicating his affection for his former partner, Joseph Klee accounted for $41.88, or a third of the total purchases. <coughs> He who spent the least was one Master Mounts, probably one of Daniel Mounts two oldest sons, John, age 12, or Frank, age 10. Master Mounts bought Richter's straight razor for 25 cents. <laughs> There's much more to know about the late 19th century German invasion of the South Sound, emanating from those 40 families that Solomon brought to Steelacum and helped get started on farms in the area as well as the many more that, like Richter and Klee, came as single young men in search of a new life. And of course, there are similar complex and fascinating stories about the influx of other nationalities to the area, the Finns to the Independence Valley in South Thurston County, the Croatians and Scandinavians who populated Old Tacoma, and so on. I recommend these volumes if, you, if you're interested. But there is one more German for us to meet this evening. I'm, so, I'm sorry, this is closest I can get to portraits of this. <laughs> Ernest, Ernst Arno Surfling was 15 years old when he settled into steerage on the ship Irma in Hamburg, bound for the New World on August 8, 1852. He accompanied his parents and seven younger siblings, ranging in age from two to 13. The family settled first in, in Illinois near Chicago, then moved on to Iowa and finally Minnesota. Ernst met and married Sophia Maria Elizabeth Bastian, 
another German, of course, in Illinois in 1857. They eventually had five daughters and one son and were still living in Minnesota when Ernst enlisted on November 28th, 1864 at the age of 30 in G Company, Minnesota 2nd Infantry. Now, I actually just found out yesterday that he had actually en enlisted in a volunteer unit two years before that uh, at a time when there were major in uh, Indian uprisings in his world in, 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 in Minnesota. Um, and so he, he joined volunteers to protect the southern border, was the phrase that, that's in, the, in, the, in, the, in, in there. So he was a soldier. Uh, he was just in time when he enlisted for the Civil War to join Solomon and Sherman for their march to the sea that winter. He was discharged seven months later. Surfling settled his growing family, his growing family first in Thurston County in 1876, then moved on to Steelicum in Pierce County by 1879. Trained as a carpenter, he undoubtedly found plenty of work in that fast-growing community. But apparently he wanted to farm as well. In 1881, Ernest, Ernst was on hand to supply the winning bid for four, of $405 for Friedrich Richter's 153 acres of flats and islands in the Zisqually Valley when the land went up for sale. When Ernst moved his family, including several teenage daughters, to Nisqually from the town of Steelacum, he may have failed to recognize, reckon on the, rural, uh, the impact rural farm life would have on his familial relationships. By 1886, Sophia, now in her mid-50s, apparently had had enough. She moved back to Steelacum where she had property of her own, taking the children, now young women on their way to becoming school teachers, and according to later documents, quote, the livestock, household goods, the piano, money, and mortgage securities in the aggregate value of upwards of $1,500 or fully one half in value of all their said possessions, including the land. Ernst eventually sued for divorce, citing desertion, and got the Nisqually property, including the house he had built overlooking the river now enlarged to over 190 acres by the acquisition of an additional 40 upland acres from the railroad. Apparently, he was anxious to sell ten, about 10 years later when the Norwegian, Orly Braggett, dressed in his best black suit with a bedroll and a small leather case strapped to his saddle, rode south to speak to Mr. Surfling in 1896. He was following a lead that his brother-in-law, uh, by the name of, of Nels Hansen, had, had given him about a divorce and guy struggling with a farm. Ollie was looking for somewhere to run the horses that made up his livery in Tacoma, and Ernst was happy to see him. So that's my tale of some, of some of the many Germans that made their homes in the South Puget Sound region in the second half of the 19th century. If you want to know more about these folks, so folks please check out my blog, and of course there is the book which, as Aaron mentioned, is on the table over there if anybody wants to see one. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. That was very interesting. Um, we will take questions. Um, see if you want to get up and take the microphone. You can just raise your hand and she'll hand you the mic so that you can be heard by everyone. Just go up there, and then we don't have any questions online yet either. Oh, I know there How was did you get started on this project? Well, um, as John Dorman, who's with us tonight, will know, I was uh, working on water quality protection along with him and many others, uh, and got involved with the, uh, the uh, uh, Nisqually River Watershed Council at a time, uh, about the time that Mr. Braggett, Kenny Braggett, ended up selling the land to the tribe. And uh, as, a, as a, for want of a better term, bureaucrat, I didn't listen too hard to his rantings and ravings because he was known to do that and everybody would roll their eyes and wait for him to put the microphone down. But eventually I did listen and got the feeling that there was a really good story there and uh, befriended Mr. Braggett, Kenny, and spent about the next six years with him 
um, doing oral histories with him and everybody else, um, as I mentioned, and uh, uh, deciding that there was a major story here. And one of the more, more fascinating parts to me was the approximately 50 years prior to the Braggots coming, um, when the land, of course, in, in the fact that we shouldn't, can't be proud of, was, t was, was taken by, by the United States government and provided to, to uh, pioneer settlers uh, through the donation land claim process um, in about 1853. Um, and uh, th 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 very interesting people from Silicon and the city of Olympia, uh, who figure in many other great stories about early times, were part of that process, owned the land for a bit before selling it off and, and to, to others. So I don't know, I just, I'm fascinated by those kinds of things, uh, tr 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 tracking it all down, thank goodness to the internet these days. I mean, you know, you could spend your life on. 15 minutes of time if you didn't have the internet. <laughs> uh, but anyway, I, I was able to learn a lot and, uh, and it turned out to be more, more exciting than being a bureaucrat at the time. <laughs> Any questions? Otto oh, has one, yes. Hold on, let's Hang get on. the mic to you. Make sure it's on Z. Testing one, two, three, four. You're good. Tim, there's some signage at Woodard Bay that you probably are aware of. It's, it speaks about, and I forget, I don't know if it was Chief Seattle or uh, it could have been another Indian chief. There was some major, let us say, um, skirmishes between uh, the settlers there and uh, the tribe. And I think it said it lasted a couple of years or something like that. Are you, if you're familiar with that situation, could you speak to that a little bit? I, I'm not. I, I don't. I don't know that sign. Um, you know that the major, the major, well-documented battles are are actually more east of, of Olympia um, than than not, and 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 east and north, um, where Leshai and his brother and others uh, f fought against the the volunteer militias uh, from the of the pioneers. Did that also? Uh, occur on the east side of the Cascades, Spokane yes. area. Was there constant? Uh... There, there were there were different different wars, if you will, at different times. But uh, Leshai spent time east of the of the Cascades, for example, with with uh, who he considered his cousins in in in, in the Yakima and other tribes. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a whole. Uh, story, big, big lot of, of books, many books on the, on the situation, for sure. Any other questions, comments? Okay, we don't have any online either, so okay. thank you, Tim. We really appreciate you being here tonight. Thank you for coming.